There you go. So welcome, as I said, to our first Mars Oxide webinar of 2021. And the Marine Social Science Network is a global community of researchers and practitioners um, covering a real range of topics around marine social sciences. And we're really, um, really enjoying this webinar series, showcasing the different methods and approaches and projects that are being used across the community. And we're really grateful to have Louisa and Dom here. who are gonna speak to us about the Coral Communities Project. Um, Louisa is an interdisciplinary social scientist from the University of Exeter and focuses her work on environmental governance using participatory methods um, and action research to understand governance processes and linking to sustainability and well-being. And Dom is a freelance artist working in the field of multidisciplinary design and sustainability. So really uses visual ethnographic research, arts-based approaches and thinking about how we can feed that and link that with traditional, more open-ended, qualitative research that some of us might be familiar with. So they're going to talk to us about their work and um, coral communities, as I said, and tell us about the project um, that they've done and really give us an opportunity to think about some different methods that we haven't covered in these seminars yet. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Dom and Louisa, and I'll be back to manage um, the Q&A. If you have any issues, any technical problems, please, please pop them in the chat box. Also, feel free to tweet and you can tag us as at MarsOxi or hashtag MarsOxi. Um, but if you have any questions for Dom and Louisa, please use the Q&A function in that and I'll facilitate the Q&A at the end of the session. Thanks guys, over to you. Um, thank you, give me a second. Oops, hang on, oh. Sorry, I've started where, I'm, where we were practicing. Hi, hopefully everyone can see my screen and hear me. I'm Louise Revens from Exeter and presenting today with Dom. Um, the project we are presenting is Coral Communities. It was funded under the UK's Global um, Challenges Research Fund. And it was very explicitly um, NERC, ESRC and AHRC, which is our natural um, Science Research Council, our Social Science Research Council, and our Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, so it was a great opportunity for us to really think about how we could be, um, you know, very meaningfully interdisciplinary, uh, crossing from natural, social, and uh, arts and humanities, but also working on co-producing sort of knowledge and understanding with partners in the Western Indian Ocean. Um, so it was part of a resilience building um, set of funding for piloting and networking really um, and we focused on um, building social ecological resilience in coral reef dependent communities in islands in the western indian ocean so we had three main objectives um, to apply and share knowledge of participatory and creative methods to mobilize conversations among participants around resilience and to condense what is known uh, about how to build resilience um, of coral reef dependent communities uh, in the Western Indian Ocean. So the project was uh, PI'd by Caroline Hattam, who was at Plymouth Marine Laboratory. Um, obviously there was a range of, um, of interdisciplinary expertise uh, and we worked very closely with two uh, freelance artists for this. Uh, the project partners were the Islamic Foundation uh, for Ecology and Environmental Sciences, Reef Conservation um, in Mauritius, and the Mwambao Coastal Community Network in Tanzania. So how we've structured our presentation today, um, Dom will introduce our approach to the visual and creative methods and talk through uh, three in uh, slightly more detail. We then uh, would like to break for some audience uh, object elicitation. So we're going to experiment with Zoom today um, for an interactive session and fingers crossed uh, we manage that within the webinar setup. So uh, bear with us as we, we trial that. Hopefully some of you brought um, objects from the sea that are meaningful to you. Um, what we'd like to invite you to do is write a description of those objects in the chat box um, if you can find a chat box, hopefully. Um, and when we break, if you can then put your hand up to indicate that you're happy to come into the panel uh, and turn your video on to introduce your object uh, to the audience, um, that would be great. Um, following our object elicitation and that interactive session, uh, Dom will share some uh, tips on uh, what we learned across all of our visual and creative methods. 
And then I will contrast these with some of our other more conventional participatory approaches. Um, yeah, and talk through some of our data in brief. All right. Um, and as uh, Emma mentioned, if you've got any questions, if you could keep those to the Q&A box separate from the chat box, if that works in webinar mode, hopefully. Right. So over to you, Dom, uh, to start. Oh, sorry, just to say, so this is a, a quick map um, for those who aren't familiar with the Western Indian Ocean. Um, we focused on uh, the region in general. So um, incorporating sort of at least five islands from the Western Indian Ocean, but we worked more closely with communities in Zanzibar in Tanzania and in Mauritius. So you can see them on the map there. All right, done. Thank you, Louisa, and thank you, Emma. And thank you everyone for coming today. So yes, my name's Dominica, short for Dom, <laughs> shortened to Dom. And I'm an artist, as Emma said, and I focus primarily in the field of sustainable design. However, I like to work across a lot of different artistic disciplines. And I like to work with other artists that do that. And I like to collaborate with people outside of the arts, including community. So as Louisa said, I'm gonna talk through the participatory methods we used and how we very quickly focused in on visual methods. I'm not gonna go into any huge depth. I hope this is okay with you all. What I'm rather gonna concentrate on is giving you an understanding of the approach we took, why we took that approach and how we want to continue. So why visual? Why visual first of all? Well, if you work visually in a workshop environment, you've got a chance of breaking down some kind of hierarchy that might exist within the community and certainly breaking down hierarchy that exists between the researchers and the community. Uh, this is because of things like you can break down uh, literacy barriers, language barriers, and if a participatory visual methods uh, going well is set up well, there's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of discussions. There's a lot of making. There's a lot of image and object making. And so there's lots of different tasks people can do. And you can try and check that you include everybody in different ways and check they're comfortable with what they're doing. This also encourages um, trust building and builds empathy. And what it also signals to the community is that you want to spend time with them because these methods aren't quick, they aren't an easy option, but they demonstrate to the community that you want to give them time and room to say what they feel about their coastal environment. And you want to really get to the issues that are bothering them. And in this, in this uh, situation, it was resilience. And you want to get to their feelings and you want to understand those feelings. And that's what's really important at the heart of visual methods. So we knew it very early on. If you'd like to turn to the next slide, please, Louisa. We knew very early on that we needed to look at the latest research and visual methods, but we also needed to look at the visual methods our NGO partners were using because they were already using visual methods on a daily basis. So they knew a lot more than us already. And it was apparent very on, early on, this was going to be a real exchange between skills and knowledge and methods that were being already used. However, I did know that I needed to bring in my recent work in visual methods because I had concentrated recently on eliciting data with people whilst in the landscape with them, using the raw material of the landscape. So, I knew I needed to bring this into the methodologies that we were going to use. If you'd like to turn to the next slide, thank you. As the project uh, progressed, we realized that we were building a series of visual methods and they were like a concertina. So if you squeeze the methods together, you think of that analogy, you might only have one to two hours to run a visual method workshop. However, you can still gain some insight in that one to two hours and you can just choose one method and something will still come out. But if you've got say two days or you're lucky enough to have a week and we dream of longer, then you can really get 
out a lot more depth from running a series of visual methods and looking at what order those methods might be in. Next slide, please. Now, what I'm going to do is quickly pull out three of our seven methods and give you some stories, some small stories around them. So the next slide. So we knew we needed a method to explain why as, re as researchers are we going to the West Indian Ocean and working with NGOs and the community there. The community needs to understand why did we want to know their place and understand resilience in their context. So of course, we had to look at research positionality. And here is Richard Ede. He's one of the last lobster pot makers in the town where I work in Cornwall which is at the very bottom of England. It's a county right at the foot of the United Kingdom. And Richard Ede sells his pots now to tourists, hardly any fishes. And he's only allowed on the slipway from now until Easter day. And when the tourists actually start arriving in numbers, believe it or not, he's no longer allowed to sell his pots to tourists on the slipway. So here already you have a story coming up that shows that as a community uh, in this place where I work, there's already vulnerability and resilience issues. The next slide. Richard Ede was absolutely delighted to make a pot for the community in Northern Mauritius. And the community in Northern Mauritius on day two nominated that their youngest member of the workshop age 17, should accept this lobster pot as a gift and take it home to his family. And later I heard from reef conservation and the community that he paraded the pot home and awarded it to his family. Now the pot created a lot of uh, discussion, but so did the postcards that are hanging off the pot. They loved them because they could see the boats in the harbour where I worked. They could see the houses and the second home issue, the posh properties around the edge of the harbour. And they love the food that we also brought from the Cornish culture. The next slide. When we went to Zanzibar, we went to northern Zanzibar, to the island of Pemba, to, to an island off the west coast called Fundu Island. And there we took the method slightly further in terms of we actually all drew our home place. So where I'm from, it's like Italy. I live on the boot of the United Kingdom and it's the shape of a boot. And I grew up on the heel and I live on the toe. So I was able to explain to the community that I came from a very, a more sheltered, although it can be wild, uh, part, and that I worked in a more uh, wild surf-based culture on the North Coast. And then the community from Findu Island drew the map of their island and explained how their West Coast was wild and their East Coast was sheltered. Next slide. Now, I couldn't bring a lobster pot to Zanzibar. I wouldn't have got it through customs this time. There's a story about that <laughs> in terms of Mauritian customs. But what I was able to bring was smaller baskets from a town near to where I grew up called Porth Leven. And here we have some small baskets made out of willow from Devon. And this town has recently gentrified. In the last 10 years, nearly every single home on the harbour front is a second home. And these biscuits aren't your traditional ginger Cornish fairings, for those of you that know Cornwall. These are Cornish seaweed biscuits, a new enterprise. Now, the community were very interested to hear about the problems of the harbour, but what struck equal amounts of uh, conservation, conservation uh, conversation, sorry, was the, uh, uh, how inferior their seaweed was to ours. I also brought them dry seaweed to try and I left all the prices on for them to see um, and they couldn't believe the prices. And if we go to the next slide, what was interesting was this provoked a fantastic lunch the following day, the following work, we had two days to workshop and they made us a seaweed salad and fish and fresh coconut to drink. And yes, their seaweed salads were certainly better than ours. If we go to the next slide, thank you. Now I'm gonna move quickly to another method. This method is more well-known. We call that last method gift exchange, which of course a lot of people do do. This next method is, if we go to the next slide, 
based on participatory three-dimensional modelling, mapping a landscape with a community. So in Mauritius and Zanzibar, we asked the community to make a map of their coastscape. We actually asked them in Mauritius to break into smaller groups and work in a see-through tank. You will have seen this tank in earlier slides. And what we did was we asked me to go out and collect materials that were around them, raw materials from the landscape, and then come back and as a group decide whether to make an abstract or representational or a simulational model of their landscape. And the box becomes like a theatre box in a way. So we're not just using existing visual methods, we're starting to bring in other art disciplines. Later on, I'm hoping you'll see, we also brought in fine art photography and one of the other artists, Andy Hughes, that we work with is in the audience and he's a fine art photographer. If we move to the next slide, rather than me talking further about the method, I'm going to play you a video clip from a film made by Andy Hughes and his students. Yeah, Throughout the process, we recorded what we did, how we did it, and the conversations we had together, so we could share them with others. We used photographs, drawings, video artworks of all sorts to capture our work and what the reefs mean to local people. All the plastic bags, the bottles, and so on and so on. What will happen to our, our environment? So that slide. That video clip I'm hoping shows you that the community were asked not to just work spatially, but to work in a sensory way by using water, by collecting materials that were around them. It triggered their senses and we started to create a soundscape as well. And we're really interested in developing an ethnographic soundscape with this method. So we'd like to work with sound artists now as well. What I hope is also apparent to you is of the importance of using raw material in general and how, for instance, it brought up a, con a conversation about plastics that were found as they collected um, materials for the coastscape making. Now I'm swiftly moving on to the third method. And if we go to the next slide, this method now involves all of you. This method is about object elicitation and looking at objects connected to the sea. And if we move to the next slide, we'd now like you to share your objects. And uh, have we got anybody typing their objects in the chat box, Louisa? I'm looking. So I've, yeah, I've stopped sharing for the minute so we can see what's in here. I hope, what I don't know is whether, right, here we have some objects. Uh, thank you very much for those of you who've typed in. Hi, Emma. Um, so we have a collection of stones found by the estuary shore, not found in the sea, but affected by the sea, sometimes covered by the sea. Um, and then we have Ness Smith talking about, I have a piece of mangrove wood from Madagascar from when I was working there in 2004. Um, so I wonder whether um, you guys, okay, we have more, thank you. Keep them coming in on the chat box if you can. I have one of the shells I collected when I visited a beach to swim. I have lapaz shells from the Azores where I work. Oh, nice. Sea glass from Lyme Regis. I love that. A natural sponge. Fabulous. So what um, we would like you or some of you to come on to um, the panel with us to turn on your video and share um, your objects with the audience. Recycled fishing nets into a bracelet. Nice. An egg purse. Fabulous. Um, so if you're happy to come on, are you able to raise your hands to indicate that we could uh, bring you onto the panel? I hope that works in webinar view. Um. Uh. 
Oh, there we go. We have Ness Smith. Are you happy to come on? So Emma, can you see hands? I can't seem to see hands, but maybe you can see hands. I can see hands, but I'm adding them as panelists as they go. So they should be coming up on your screen. Fabulous. Yes. Um, so maybe Ness, because I can see you first, are you happy to show us your um, object and to explain a little bit more about the meaning of it to you? There we go. That's my um, little bit of mangrove. I, it's a knot from, from a mangrove. Um, I, I saw it when I was doing, um, we were re researching the mangroves down in southwest Madagascar, uh, mapping the extent and looking at um, sort of regeneration and how they were doing in general. Um, I, I, I just saw this and thought it was really sculptural, really beautiful. And it was my absolute happy place for the whole year I was in Madagascar, just loved it there. And I've kept it and taken it everywhere I've been in the world ever since. And I still have it now. And, and I really love it. Yeah, I really love it too. It is very mm. special, as you say. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you very much for, for sharing. Um, Bacaleles, is that right? I hope I pronounced that correctly. If you're happy to share yours, that would be fab fabulous. I think you're still on mute. Are you happy to unmute? Okay. So these are just kind of different shapes, I suppose, that I, I found mm. by the shore of black, black stones. Um, so yeah, they're not, they're not, I just was sort of intrigued by how, when you take them out of the context, you know, away from the shore, how suddenly they became very, I mean, it's a very special shore. The estuary of the Helford Passage is very sort of in, in Cornwall, mm -hmm. is uh, particularly special to me. But so, and these, these are just found there. So, in, but in a way I struggled with the question was I thought, oh, but they're not, are they from the sea or are they from the land? So I was kind of, yeah, I suppose, but they are, I suppose they, they take their shape from the sea although they're very ge geometrical. So I just find them intriguing. Yeah, that's lovely, thank you. And and I guess anything that makes you think of estuarine waters and the sea and um, mm. the place being Cornwall. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Alison, I can see you, hi. Hi, I came late, I missed the beginning of the webinar, unfortunately, but I have two things. I have a lapis shell and lapis, um, you know, are an old food that people used to always eat. And then they become something that's actually um, sort of high cuisine in, in Azores, uh, Portugal. Um, you eat the little critter that's there and it sticks on a rock. Um, this was in my plant, unfortunately, it's covered with ants. So I'm fighting a bit with the little ants. But I wanted to show you something else I remembered that I had. These are made from parrotfish fish scales. So in Azores, um, a lot of um, people still make jewelry. These are uh, earrings and they also make other sculptures out of um, fish scales. Um, and many of them also use natural colorings because these aren't, they're normally white. So, um, Anyways, those are my, these are made in a lot of, I know in Asia, in certain countries, um, it's much more common to be made also. Mm. Dom, it makes me think, because um, when you were talking, Dom, about the um, basket traps and the biscuits and things that were involved in the gift exchange, they also had a link to kind of micro enterprise in the place that you're from. And I imagine taking those fish scale earrings to, um, Mauritius or Zanzibar would have had a, a similar reaction of, of interest in, in how something, you know, livelihood based could be made from, from the sea. Yeah, definitely. I think we'll touch on that a little bit more soon as well, but that's really great. And it's lovely to see a collection of objects. And I like how Alison held them right up to the screen and moved them around as well. Mm. Thank you. Um, so Julia, I can see you now. Yeah, um, so I'm very far from the sea at the moment, unfortunately, missing the sea a lot. So I have something that is actually something I, I bought, I guess it's a piece of recycled fishing net, but I guess it gave me a lot of hope to think that 
um, I guess the ways we can work together as a society and different creative ways we can have for bringing the ocean closer to people, especially people in landlocked places or right now where so many of us are stuck somewhere where maybe we don't want to be. Um, and yeah, just, um, yeah, it just gave me a lot of hope to think of, I guess, also how innovation can help bring these feelings closer. So when you, um, when you take this object with you or this bracelet with you, does it, do you remember the sea always when you wear it or look at it? Yeah, I think it's more like a little piece of like hope in a way, like hope of like a shared understanding of there are ways of, I guess, tackling the pro big problems that we have at the moment and the ideas of there are people working with me on this, even though I don't know, them. like I don't know the people exactly who made this bracelet, but I know they have these same shared values as I do. And I guess that gives me hope. Um, yeah, nice, thank you. Right, I hope, uh, so uh, Nina, I can see you now, thank you. Julia. Hi. So, hi everyone. Um, I have a seal scapula here Ooh. and I picked this up and it's just so beautiful. I love it so much. And I picked this up one day on a sort of a coastal walk with a, a lovely marine biologist that I made friends with um, in South Africa. And it was just this beautiful morning of going out with him and um, he was yeah, quite an elderly man and he just became, he became so animated in the water. Um, and afterwards we had tea and biscuits on the rocks um, and he taught me so much. And, and um, when I picked this up, he said, oh, you can varnish it and then put, you know, eat peanuts out of it or something. And I, and I just thought, well, I don't think I'll do that, but um, I, I, it is very beautiful. So yeah, it was a, a lovely memory as well, as well as being beautiful. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's quite precious. Thanks for sharing. Um, and Timor, I can see you there. Thanks for joining us too. Thank you everyone for sharing. It's really lovely to see you all typing in the chat and keep doing so if you've got your objects and also for joining us on the panel. So Timor, yeah, hi. Hi. Um, so I brought, I'll get it. Oh, it's kind of fading in and out. Um, so I brought a sponge. Um, it's kind of got two, two meanings to it. Um, I bought it in the Aegean region of, of Turkey, um, which is where I'm, I'm half Turkish. I used to spend a lot of time there as a kid. Um, I think it's where I really got my love for the ocean. And historically, they have a long history of not so much anymore, but of um, sponge divers. And I guess it, it kind of took on a, a dual meaning when, um, so I, for, for, for those who don't know, I used to work with Mumbai Coastal Community Network, one of, one of the partners in coral communities. And there was one day where we were doing um, some participatory uh, coral reef monitoring. We had some like homemade slate for recording, like um, uh, for doing fish ID and everything. And then we couldn't, I couldn't rub it off with the eraser that I brought. So then one of the guys from the community, he quickly like dove down and grabbed a little bit of sponge. And it was just the, it was the best like eraser. <laughs> it was a lot better than the shop bought eraser. And it, and it kind of, yeah, I got, got, a, got it for a sponge to use in the shower, but then learned that there's many uses for sponges. Nice, thank you very much. Um, I love how you're connecting your different places and your different homes in that story. That's really nice. Um, all right, I think, um, Dom, are you happy if we um, carry on? So you guys who are now panelists, um, we don't know how to reverse that. So you will remain panelists, but feel free to um, switch off your cameras or your, and, and certainly to mute yourselves if you don't mind, thank you. Um, and it does mean that if you've got any questions or reflections at the end, um, it'd be easy to add you back on again. And um, I will share my screen again and, and we'll carry on for a bit. Uh, give me a second. Um, all right. Thank you. There we go. So I'm just going to speak for another five minutes and then hand back to Louisa and then we're going to have a Q&A so we'll see more of you. I really love seeing some of the audience and I loved how as you all got used to talking and seeing each other holding the objects, you started holding the objects more and moving them around. Um, I would love just to carry on doing that the whole hour and we could actually create a new visual method in this lockdown scenario that a lot of us are in. 
Um, what I'm going to do instead, if that's all right, because I think you'll want to know, is how we move the method uh, further along than just it being an icebreaker and how we engage the community with this, that they became part of the co-developers of the method. So when we worked with Zanzibar, uh, when we worked in Zanzibar with people like Timur, who you just saw, and he's going to speak in a minute again, um, we had time actually to develop the method further because we went there after Mauritius. So by now, the facilitators were starting to know the facilitators better. And here we also had uh, an extra day with the community, really. We had two whole long days run back to back with the community. At the end of the first day, we gave each member of the workshop a basket from Pember Island, an indigenous basket, and asked them if they would take it home and put objects that meant something to them about the sea, about their sea, just like we asked you. And what was amazing, the next day, not only did we have two or three objects in the basket, the baskets were nearly all filled to the brim. It was really exciting. And then Ali, who Timor might mention uh, soon, Ali, uh, one of the facilitators from Mambo Community uh, Coastal Network, said, let's make this into a gigantic map as well. And he drew a grid in the sand, uh, compared it to like a SWOT analysis. And in this grid, he said, let's put in one square past ecological resilience and another square past social resilience. And the last two, present ecological resilience, present social resilience. And then he asked the community to turn the objects out of their basket and to place the objects where they felt they sitted within that grid. And this went on for a long time, with much discussion. So people individually thought about it, then they started talking. And what we ended up with was a community map of objects. And if we had a drone, it was incredible uh, to see, but it was big enough that actually it became very performative and we could stand in the squares and we could stand around the outside of the squares. And if we go to the next slide, what happened then was, how we've just worked with you, uh, we then worked with the community. So they told us the stories about their objects. But not only did they say why they'd brought the object and what it meant to them, they then explained why they'd put it where they had in this grid. And here we have a member of the community explaining about his sheath of corn. So corn is under pressure, like a lot of food production on the island, a lot of fishes and farmers. And this is due to issues with fertilizer, but in this case, he talks about how his corn is affected by climate change. It's no longer the corn that it used to be. And if we move to the next slide, what happened was in Zanzibar, we didn't have the see-through tanks to work in to make the three-dimensional models, the maps. What we did was work straight onto the sand and made one gigantic community map. So a bit like the object map. And here we have Alice Ali, the fantastic facilitator, saying, raising his hands and now saying to everyone, now you've made a fantastic outline of Fundu Island. Now, where do some of the objects fit on this island? So this is a, an incredible merging of the methods. So we, we do do this and methods can blur and merge. And I just want to point out on this slide, perhaps Louisa, you can do it with a cursor. Um, Louisa wasn't in Zanzibar, so she doesn't know this image as well as me, but can you see the coconut husks down from the green basket? Um, yeah, see on the floor, the bottom left of the green bucket, sorry, not basket, there's some coconut husks. Now the community explained to us that those represented octopus enclosures. And if we look at the blue plastic that's been used, that was found, uh, it was been washed up, they used that to mark the reef on the island. And if we look at the plants placed at the bottom left of the map, thanks Louisa, that's it. Those were mangrove forests. And what happened then is the objects started getting added to the map. And where Ali's standing, I think about there, a glass object got put down. And we think this was to do with glass been represented on the island. Timo might correct me on that fact, because that's one of those bits of data I haven't been managed 
to sew together yet. And that's an important point to make. We were prototyping ideas. We, we weren't putting all our energies into working out how to collect data exactly. We were testing the ideas and then putting forward how we might turn some of this participatory research action into more data. So things like the glass hasn't got totally resolved. But if we move to the next slide, what I want to say is that in Zanzibar, we were able to run all the seven steps together really over two days. And I thought this was a good time to bring Timur in rather than just listen to Louisa and I, because at the time he worked for the NGO there. And I thought he might give us some insights, especially around perhaps gender and faith, Timor, if that was all right. Timor, you're still a panelist, mm -hmm. so shoot you. You should be able to put your video and mic back Okay, up. you can hear me? Yes, thanks, Timor. Great, thanks, Dom. Uh, and thanks for uh, inviting me to come along and share some, some of my thoughts on it. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it was a really interesting reflection, especially around um, around gender. Z Zanzibar, it has quite it's quite a patriarchal society. So, um, one of the reasons why at Mwambao we really liked and tried to use a lot of participatory methods is when you would use more conventional qualitative approaches like focus groups, for example. It, it's quite a it, it will quite often revert to the typical norms to do with gender. So the conversations with, and discussions would very often be dominated by men, whereas women would be much more in, in the background because it'd be sorts of uh, a focus group kind of represents what um, the community would have with like a, a formal meeting or discussions. Um, but actually having this sort of creative activity, it, it, it almost created like a, a new space or a neutral space. I'm sure Dom remembers there was one moment where one of the participants, there was a male participant who put something down, uh, one of the objects down and there was a, a lady who she, she started shouting and was like, no, no, it's not there. And he, he kind of quickly then picked it back up and she then went and, and placed it. So it, it really created this space that was quite neutral and, and because it, it was, I think quite unfamiliar. It, it almost it was able to um, disrupt to some extent um, gender norms. Um, I mean, in terms of the the faith aspects of it, I think that as as scientists and researchers, we often see what we're doing um, through our own worldviews. Um, whether that's in the, the mode of inquiry or, or the kind of values that we place on on something like nature and, and the environment. Um, so I think by, by having this faith lens to it, it, it really, it, it, by, by framing resilience and, and the environment and especially protection of the environment and conservation, it was framed through religion and faith. So it, it's more, it's much more through the worldview of, of, of the local community and especially through a, a moral system. Um, and I, I should note that that really built upon a lot of groundbreaking work that was done by uh, my former colleague Ali Thani, who, who Don mentioned. Um, and I think also, especially with the kind of, with the dynamics of having uh, foreign researchers coming in, yes, we're, we're working with, um, working with Mombao as a local partner and having local facilitators, there's still, there's still that difference and there's still that sense of unfamiliarity, but then Mark, who's in, who's in the photo here, um, so he, he's with IFIS, the um, Islamic Foundation for Ecology and Environmental Science, he, he's, he's a Muslim. And he then, after the map was created, he, he led a faith-based discussion. And it was, it was really nice and to see just how much the, the barriers had broken down between him and, and the, the, the male participants, because it, they'd found this, this commonality and this, um, a way of relating um, they, they might not otherwise have had. Um, so yeah, I think it, it was a really interesting activity for us to observe as Mwambao, even with us having done us, they no, no longer work with them, but um, using quite a lot of participatory methods already, but to kind of see even more creative ones um, that, that could be used. That's brilliant. Thanks, Timor. That's really great. Um, and that Timor can, of course, um, answer any other questions you might have as well, because he was very close. And we've got other members of the Coral Communities team in the audience. I think we've got Andy Hughes and we've got some students new to participatory methods from photography. And I, think, I know there's a few other people I know in the audience, but please all keep 
typing your objects into the comment box because we'd love to look at the descriptions even if we can't see you speaking and um, type any questions you have in the Q&A. And I'm now just going to summarize the object elicitation to say all the time we are, even though we're not on the Coral Communities Project, we are still thinking about how these methods can move. How can we adopt, adapt, uh, get more creative as Tima was saying, um, with these methods. And I just want to talk quickly about a program that's on in the United Kingdom at the moment called the Repair Shop. And I'm sorry for all of the, those of you that are in the audience that can't access the BBC iPlayer where this program's held. But I just want to bring it up because it's a building in the United Kingdom in the British countryside that's full of some of our best craftspeople. And what happens in this building is that members of the community can bring an object that means something to them, uh, usually mm -hmm. about the historical or social past. And they can bring it to be repaired because it's broken. And what happens is not only do you get, like with all of you, this story start to build around the objects and people become more comfortable talking and you hear about social and historical encounters between families and between whole social things going on in society at the time. What happens is when this, for instance, pigeon last week, it was on last week, this pigeon was taken apart to get repaired. You started to learn about the object biography to use an anthropological term. So the object itself, yes, is connected to people and stories, but the object actually stands alone. It has its own story. And one of the strongest stories the object has is its materiality. So when this pigeon was taken apart, it had bellow, a bellow inside it. And this bellow was made of animal intestine. So it could make this coo coo sound as it was wheeled along. And so the craftspeople used the correct animal intestine to get it to make the sound again. Um, but you also learned about how the wheels were cast in the past. And after the pigeon was collected, the emotions that came out from the community member that brought it in were even stronger. And all, the story grew. But also a table for playing cards on was repaired after the pigeon. And you learned about where the wood came from on that table, how the polish was made for that table. And all these materials came from the land. So as Louisa said earlier, they connect to micro businesses of the past. And perhaps potential ideas for the future. And that's why the object elicitation is central really to our visual methods as much as map making is. And I just wanted to finish that with that thought in our minds as now we move to the next slide. Thanks. So I'm just going to now mm -hmm. spend a couple of very quick minutes um, giving you some tips. I'm doing that um, because it shows um, how we were using the method um, in a slightly different way, perhaps than some people, even though the methods are well known rather. So uh, I've just got a, me a message from Karen Morrissey, one of the Coral Community team members saying that glass on the island of Fundu was put on the map to represent the first making of glass on the island. So that's really great. Um, team might pick up on that later to verify that. Anyway, working groups is so important you create different meanings all together you build trust you create empathy and we move to the next slide quickly work outside as much as possible i can't emphasize this it can be hot it can be difficult but try to use the landscape like a stage i could talk about this slide for another 10 minutes there's so much data in here that we'll move to the next slide if you have to work indoors use natural light if you can create drama we move to the next slide. Encourage the participants to get creative. So you can have props hidden away. The people in this group wants to make their coral alive, not bleached. So I had some paint hidden. But first of all, use the material of the place, the raw material. We move to the next slide. Bring out participant creativity build confidence. And this is not just for the community, this is also for facilitators. So the facilitators shared skills, and this is really important. We all, there was a lot of us in the end that were used to facilitating. We started sharing skills between us as well as with the community, and the community started telling us ideas. 
Here, if I need to know to use a gyro stabilizer, I would like to access one to make my video smoother. You move to the next slide. Again, the performative. Don't be scared of being dramatic. Turn out the lights if you want to speak about the future. And with the resilience, that's really important. Resilience wasn't understood by this group. They said it's really, how could you survive in the future? That was their notion of resilience. That was a better way of talking about it. So now I'm going to hand over to Louise. Uh, and she's perhaps going to, I think, give you um, a bit more, quick, some quick insight to how we communicated the visual methods outside of the community as well as within it after the events. And she's going to also reflect about how the methods uh, sat in with the wider context of the project coral communities. Thanks, Louisa. Uh, yeah, so just a couple of slides briefly to show how sort of in addition to the multi-sensory methods that Dom's talked through, we try to explore both um, the written and the visual. Um, so with the written, we use um, sort of real and virtual coding. So you can see these hashtags written on little glass um, I think they're microscope um, plates of slides, which people could dot into their various um, displays and the work that they were creating over the over the time with us in in Mauritius and, and Zanzibar. Um, and you could take this further, you could move this online and carry on the conversation through the social media hashtags and things like that. Obviously, in some of the contexts in which we work, you have to be a little careful of using um, written words. Um, you know, where there might be illiteracy or a lack of confidence or, uh, you know, language barriers or simply where, you know, people like me aren't very uh, confident on social media and so on. But um, thinking also beyond the visual, basically. Um, and then, of course, we put a lot of emphasis on to um, visual documentation and, and visual sharing. And, you know, throughout all the photos in this presentation, hopefully you've seen how different participants were recording the information in different ways. So there's always someone with a phone camera or the GoPro or a dictaphone, or in this case, um, you know, the facilitators were taking photographs of activities in the field and printing them out in real time and displaying them in real time to try and, um, you know, tap into uh, deeper understandings and the emotions of uh, the discussions and the activities that were going on. Um, and, and we did this both in real time, so as activities were happening, um, but also to bring everything sort of together at the end. So um, a lot of the activities that we were involved in hap happened simultaneously. So, for example, I spent a lot of time in a kind of more traditional workshop setting that we'll get to in a minute, uh, whilst John was out in the field with communities. Um, and not everyone could see everything that was going on, but we wanted to bring all the stakeholders and the communities and the researchers together. So we had this um, exhibition at the end that combined all the different media that we were working with. Um, so you can see the 3D models there, you can see photos from the photo elicitation, from the fine artwork that we did, um, you know, from the photos that were taken in the field during object uh, elicitation or through transect walks or um, all the various um, things. Um, and what was really important then is the conversations that could happen around that sharing. So, um, you know, different members of the community talking about what they had been involved in that week um, and thinking about what to do with all that stuff. So who owns it, where is it going after, um, the activities and the workshops and, and the exhibition and so on. Um, and I suppose it allows people to share, you know, information on what they've been doing with each other, but also thinking about whether to take it further into their communities after that. So, um, you know, they took away a lot of these materials and kept them um, for future kind of opportunities. Um, so, yeah, I think it's helpful. Um, to contrast a little bit the visual and creative methods that Dom has been talking about with the more conventional participatory methods that we also used in this project. Um, so here's a kind of iconic workshop photograph. I'm sure many of you that work in participatory methods and through workshops have a similar photograph either taken at the beginning or at the end of one of your workshops. Um, you know, it's very recognizable 
uh, collective of, of sort of workshop participants. Um, and yeah, and I just want to talk, so we had two methods that ran in, in uh, parallel to the more creative methods, um, which were a desktop review and multi-stakeholder workshops. We ran one in Mauritius and we ran another in the UK. Um, so for the desktop review um, to kind of organize um, our work, we developed a conceptual model of resilience building strategies. Uh, some of which were explicitly about resilience building and others which were more around uh, conservation and development type interventions. Um, we had sort of 14 strategies that were arranged from more ecological focus to more social focused. And we used these to, uh, yes, organize our review of the literature. Trying to focus in particular on what evidence we could find um, for the implementation of these strategies in the Western Indian Ocean. So again, you know, a conceptual model will be a, a more a familiar kind of approach that many of you would use. Um, so I won't run through our data in detail because we do want to get to some kind of reflections and Q&A in a minute um, and have focused mainly on our methods and approach. Um, but just to say that we developed uh, resilience report cards uh, and you can find these online and they sort of detail the evidence that we did found, find um, for ecological impacts, social impacts, and implications for ecological and social resilience. Um, and then for each, using the workshop data, we develop case studies from the Western Indian Ocean, which try to bring to life these different um, strategies. Um, so you can see report cards for 50, uh, 14 strategies um, online. Um, and and yes, so we did the desktop review and then we took some of those report, um, reports in draft form to a multi-stakeholder workshop. So um, involving government um, staff, NGO staff, um, you know, indoors using all the familiar <laughs> sort of um, materials. So you can see the flip charts, you can see um, the sticky notes, um, working round tables um, and, you know, uh, still very participatory, but perhaps missing the more creative elements that we were developing in the outdoor activities that we were involved in. Um, so because we are fairly short on time, I won't run through our data, but I do want to point to the, the fact that within the more controlled environment of this indoor multi-stakeholder workshop, it was much easier to document the information you know, through flip charts, through audio recorders on the tables that we could then transcribe and analyze. Um, and, you know, adding that to the literature that came from the, the desktop reviews was much more sort of familiar uh, working practice for us, um, I suppose. So just to flick through these. Um, and, you know, obviously, because we were sort of experimenting with the creative and the participatory, we were quite conscious that we had separated in some ways our methods. So we were using more visual creative methods with communities and we were using more conventional or standard participatory workshop methods with government and NGO stakeholders. And we wanted to try and break down those barriers uh, a little bit. So we brought our government and NGO stakeholders outside and they also participated in um, some of the fi fine art photography, the 3D um, seascape modeling. Uh, we did that in Mauritius with our um, stakeholders um, and also in the UK. So we have people from the funders here, from NGOs in the UK um, and so on, experimenting with the 3D modeling, um, thinking about perspective and you can see that it's not the beautiful sand of Mauritius here, but the sort of estuarine sand of Exmouth that we used, which is where I live. Um, but similar conversations came out around both the sort of risks and threats to our marine environments, but also uh, optimism about the future of these environments through these creative methods. Um, and, you know, everyone found it really interesting to get tactile and to think visually and to think um, about the different senses that they were engaging with here. Um, so uh, the point of, of kind of trying to contrast our participatory methods was to highlight a couple of tensions that came out 
for us in this work and that we're sort of grappling with uh, when trying to write up some of this um, work. So the first was around, you know, whose creativity and whose voice we're interested in. Um, you know, creativity was, was core to the participatory approach that we were trying to um, apply. Um, but it was kind of more automatic for us to think about that in terms of community and a little more awkward for us to think about that in terms of um, the more official stakeholders that we were working with. Um, so, you know, we thought about, can we ask the government uh, to sit on the floor? Can we ask them to lie on the floor to look at the, you know, the 3D model from a different perspective and things like that. And obviously we did in this case, but if you would think about taking that further to say a UK context, you know, would you get a suit from DEFRA to sit on the floor or lie on the floor to, to um, look at a seascape from a different point of view? Um, kind of brings up questions around our typical routines and habits when we employ sort of more creative and participatory methods. Um, so the first tension was around, you know, who we're getting creative with and why we find it difficult to think about different stakeholders um, being creative. Uh, the other was around productive fun. Um, so, you know, a lot of the activities were really enjoyable and engaging activities, um, but there was lots of things going on at the same time. So it became very difficult to uh, collect all the data from all these activities. Um, and, you know, we became a little bit unsure about whether, you know, whether we were having too much fun and, you know, not enough kind of, productivity in terms of trying to um, yeah, uh, collect and document and report on all the data. Um, so obviously the project sat within action research and we were interested in, in the action as much as the research. Um, but even that we couldn't necessarily kind of document all the different conversations that were happening within the communities and stakeholders that we were working with. And Dom, you have a nice anecdote I think about um, you know, a project that's too fun is considered not productive enough or something. <laughs> so we'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and that sort of leads to our third kind of tension, which is around this idea of action research. Um, the last marine social science um, presentation sort of encouraged us all to be uh, activist researchers. Um, and obviously we, you know, we agree in, in principle with that. Um, but many of us are working in places where we don't live and, um, you know, we try as much as possible not to be sort of fly in, fly out researchers. We work quite closely with the NGOs um, on the ground um, and that's the kind of pathway to impact as it were. Um, but we're quite conscious that that puts a lot of responsibility onto our NGO partners to translate um, in some ways the purpose of a lot of this visual creative methodology for communities when, you know, uh, when their needs uh, are sometimes more immediate or when you're trying to translate or explain the more tangible outcomes that can come from some of these methods. So, um, so there was a tension also around our role within an action research um, framework. So we don't have, you know, the answers to those reflections, but we'd be interested to hear your thoughts. I'm, um, conscious that we are over our hour, um, but I will stop sharing the screen in a second and we'll invite any of you who'd like to comment further to add your reflections to ours. Thank you very much. And Risa, could you just put, oh great, she's put the last slide on. Um, ah, I haven't put it on there. I'm just saying, I know people are having to go. We're definitely losing our NGOs. We had um, Wendy Brewer from Green Map System who's just left and Timor from Mambo Community Coastal Network, but at least you saw him. I'm hoping someone from Reef Conservation is out there, but they might have had to go. I'm just going to say, um, Emma, perhaps any Q&As can also be answered via Twitter and Instagram. I'll keep an eye on it. And I've looked at the questions there. I don't know what you feel, um, Emma, if it's fair to keep some people on if they can to answer some questions or not. <laughs> Thank you both so much for that and Timor for joining in and thank you so much to our attendees who were very brave and came on as panellists and we got to trial a new thing in Zoom. I've not done that before, <laughs> seeing people backwards and forwards, it worked quite well. Um, I'm happy to stay on for the 10 minutes to answer um, Q&A um, 
for, for now if you guys can. Um, um, there's no worries, the recording will be made available. So even if people have had to leave, they'll, their answer will still, their, their question will still be recorded. Um, and absolutely we can we can put um, additional questions out over Twitter. Um, and um, also a note to just say that we were sharing all of the links that Don was putting in the chat as well. We'll make sure that they all get shared alongside the YouTube um, recording and on the Mars Oxi website. And if you do want to get in touch with Louisa or Don, please get in touch with us at MarsOxi. So info at MarsOxi.net. And um, if you haven't jotted down their email addresses or can't find them, and we can facilitate that for you. So please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. And um, so we have a few questions that I'm going to go to in the Q&A um, box. And I'll try and keep us going till about quarter past. And then if we don't manage to answer everything, um, we will, we can, as I said, we can respond through, through other means. And um, we have one from Lisa McDonald, who says, thank you so much for a great presentation. Just wondering if you invited local artists to be involved in the co-facilitation and documentation of the project. Yes, uh, is the answer to that, but I didn't do it from the beginning. And there's, there's several reasons for that. Um, Louisa, uh, it would have been good if Caroline was here as well, wasn't it, the project indicator, but, and the NGO, if reef conservation is out there, I don't think they are now. Um, it'd be great if they waved their hand. Um, but we were very, uh, it, it, it actually isn't, it wasn't a huge project, was it, Louisa? Um, we're talking about, in terms of these types of projects, the budget for the measure methods was quite small. So, and I'd not worked with these particular NGOs before, though I have worked with other NGOs. We were accessing the community through the NGOs and they work with the community in a certain way, not an artistic way. So I tried hard from the beginning to connect to even basket makers, so craftspeople as well as other artists. But what happened was it was much better once I was there. I could do that better. And so for instance, in our, I didn't go into, someone else asked this, I haven't gone into the types of communities you work with, their faiths, their languages, the numbers. <sighs> it's another whole story, um, it's an exciting one. But I found, for instance, in our Hindu community in Northeast Mauritius, a fantastic designer who was at the beginning of their career and was quite similar to me in some ways so it was really exciting for me and they actually designed our Coral Communities logo for us and they co-produced the newspaper with me added, as did some students from the United Kingdom um, and I'd obviously like to have taken this further and further and I have been back to Mauritius since and I've been in conversation with that community member and some of their colleagues that we worked with. And it's something, if we had a bigger budget, I would work a lot harder to do because your methods are gonna work better if you've got artists working with traditional facilitators and it helps the NGOs. The NGOs are short of time. They need support and confidence to work creatively. Quite creatively. Hope that makes sense. That's great. Thanks, Dom. Yeah, it's always that funding question is always a challenge. <laughs> always, always the age old question of how do we get funding for it to, <laughs> to keep things going? Um, and I really, I, I mean, personally, I, I've always been really interested in the Coral Communities Project. It's the first time I've gotten to see such a dedicated session on it. And it's been fascinating to hear, you know, the various methods that you've used and the various insights. In particular, I think some of the comments on your own positionality and, and, and Julia posted a question about that around, um, so you've got two quest questions, see if we can get through both. Did you, did your research also include your own reflections on positionality? So reflective diaries, or did you kind of record that whole process about yourselves and, and your own positions within that research context? Um, and did you explore ways of sharing those outcomes and community perspectives with local or national decision makers um, in terms of the outcomes from the creative processes that you've, you've been discussing in today's session? I'll just give a quick answer and I'll let Louisa uh, follow on quickly as well. Um, I didn't do reflexive diaries, I'm well aware of them. Um, there's a, some personal reasons for this. Um, I, I carried out ethnographic film work a long time ago and I did all that kind of thing. Um, and I was made well aware by a mentor then, you have to ask why you're doing the research. And I did do this very early on in the project and before it was even awarded. And I am a very reflective person and within a group we try to be. And there's a number of methods we didn't talk about that we did to be all self-reflective. One of them was photo elicitation. We took photos as researchers 
before we went to Mauritius of our home place and we sent them ahead to the NGOs. We also encouraged the NGOs and other delegates from the West Indian Ocean to do this, not just the community. We also did this with the object work. We asked people to bring objects before they went to the West Indian Ocean. So we all had to do those exercises ourselves. And I'll let Louisa follow on with anything. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, as Dom said, we didn't keep diaries and things like that, but we have had a lot of discussion amongst ourselves when we're trying to write up particularly the visual method paper. So we have produced um, a paper from the project on the resilience data and the more conventional methods. And obviously that's, you know, been a sort of simpler, more straightforward process. So that one's done. Um, but for the visual paper, you know, we're interested in really showcasing the creativity of it, but also, you know, still grappling with some of the tensions that we experienced there. Um, so we have a lot of discussions, but didn't document it as such. Um, and then, um, you know, I think rather than having, uh, in, in terms of communicating with national decision-making stakeholders, they were part of the workshops and then part of the, um, you know, the final presentation of everything. And it was about encouraging the communities themselves in some ways to speak to those decision makers rather than us packaging, you know, the outputs to, for a knowledge exchange type of uh, approach to um, informing policy, I suppose. Um, but yes, again, we rely a lot on the NGO to kind of keep that going and take that forward in terms of policy influence um, and practical change on the ground. That's great. Thank you both. Um, so I think we've probably got time for one more question if we're finishing at quarter past. So I'm just going to go to Judy's question because I think it kind of follows on from the questions about presenting the results back to decision makers and to policy makers is what did the participants gain from the experience? What did you kind of observe in terms of their um, the benefits they, they I guess, yeah, obtained from, from being part of the process and being part of the project? Dom, do you want to speak first or will I? I think, is okay. I think you should go first this time. I feel like I've said too much. <laughs> so, well, um, thanks for that question. And I think that's what we are grappling with a little bit with that tension around productive fun. And, you know, obviously working in places that are, you know, that experience quite high levels of poverty, for example, or have, um, you know, perceived the environmental change to be quite a sort of live threat. Um, and an immediate threat to their livelihoods and so on. Um, so I would say that, um, you know, that they enjoyed those experiences in the field much more than they would engagement with more common research methods. Um, so I feel like that was very positive. Um, but I remember conversations with the kind of lead of the NGOs reminding us to be quite careful in how much time and and to kind of um, explain in some ways expectations around it all quite carefully, because we weren't, for example, developing, you know, we weren't developing the micro enterprise, we were just sharing ideas. And a lot of it relies on those ideas taking root. And that might not, you know, it was a nine month project. I would say that the time was more of a constraint than the funding. Um, like you just can't deliver real impact in that time, but it is all a process. And hence it was very important to work with those NGOs and to continue working with those NGOs as we try to find and sc <laughs> scramble around for more funding. Um, but yeah, that is a, um, a concern and I think we all face it in our work that we do overseas. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a conversation and a necessary conversation that's happening much more, I think, in the world we, we kind of are operating in, which is, is great. It's, it's a really important thing for us to be reflective about as researchers um, and to think about how we can ensure we're doing that in the most just and inclusive way um, and I think today's talk really highlighted some of those opportunities and those processes as well. We have got a few more questions but I'm conscious of time and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to save the Q&A box and what I'll do is send the questions to Louisa and Dom and hopefully they'll be able to provide us with some answers and we can um, include those in the Mars Oxide website and the newsletter with the link to the recording. So I'll make sure that we can respond to those. Um, and um, yeah, I guess what's all that's left is really to say thank you both so much for such an inspiring and such an engaging talk. There's been lots of great conversation and lots of 
really positive commentary in both the Q&A and the chat box. So thank you both. I really, really appreciate it. I found it fascinating. Um, would love to come to Mauritius with you next time, <laughs> just as an aside. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I'm sure everybody else on the call would too. Um, but thank you all very, very much. Um, our next Mars Oxy webinar is planned for the 25th of March. And it'll be with Peter Jones from UCL, who's going to talk about some of the work he's been doing around governance and marine protected areas. The information about that will go out in the next newsletter. Um, but again, thank you all so much. Have a good rest of day. Stay safe and stay well. And um, hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.